I'm actually really excited to be here. So it turns out if you organize an event and do a technical talk, it's, uh, it's quite a challenge. So I'm, uh, I'm really glad we made it. It was not uh, an early night uh, last night, but uh, I think we're in good shape. Huh? OK, so, so first off, does, does anyone here have these kinds of smart lights at home yet? Can we uh, see a raise of hands? Also, there's maybe a quarter to a half of, the, of the, the room here. This is very interesting. Uh, hopefully, uh, you, you will. Uh, you will have some new tricks uh, up your sleeve uh, after our talk. OK, so first off, um, who are we? My name is Tom. Uh, I'm one of the organizers of the camp here. I'm a firmware engineer at Ultimaker. And uh, I have a, a little company that makes uh, quirky electronics gadgets. And I'm here with my long-term friend, uh, Gillet. Yes. Hi, my name is Gillet Nassar. I am a security engineer and uh, an internal blue team. So I do incident response. I also like to. I also, uh, I'm quite an avid CTF player. I've been playing for about uh, 10 years with uh, my CTF team, uh, Spotless. And uh, yeah, we do, I do quite a bit of stuff in my free time, including projects such as this. I'm going to move to Tom now to introduce the rest of the first one. All right, so what are we talking about today? We're talking about uh, these, uh, these kinds of uh, smart IoT lights. First, we'll do a, a quick introduction of how we dove down the rabbit hole that we are in now. Uh, how we uh, got to this. Then we'll talk a bit about uh, the initial revision of hardware that uh, we found, then uh, a big revamp with a new type of chip where we found some new things. And finally, we'll show you a, a vulnerability that uh, we found out is running on uh, millions of devices all over the world that we use to break free of uh, internet-connected servers and run these devices locally only inside of your own network. Hopefully, at the end, there will be some room for, uh, for questions, but we'll, uh, we'll see how the time pans out. All right, so starting with our inspiration. In 2019, Dutch hackerspace Hack42 um, uh, 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 called up uh, all the troops and said, we found these devices at Action, a local store. Uh, they, are a, they are a power plug that connect to your Wi-Fi, and you can hack them to run locally. You can run whatever firmware you like on them. And they, uh, they organized this session to, uh, to hack these devices together. They put it up on their wiki. You see it on the right. They found that there's this, uh, this tool called Tuya Convert that you can use uh, to, uh, to break free these devices of the firmware that they came with and instead uh, flash your own on it. And this Tuya Convert, an open source uh, tool, turned out to be based on uh, research from CCC, uh, 35C3, uh, by uh, Michael from Vtrust, who's actually sitting right here in the room. Uh, so he, uh, he found a, a really cool bug that allowed you to uh, take control of the device and flash your own firmware to it. And how did it work? So the device connects to the server of the manufacturer. Uh, it, uh, it has a, a sort of handshake where it sends some information, including this thing uh, called the PSK ID. And then it starts encrypting the connection with uh, TLS PSK, pre-shared key. This pre-shared key, though, it was derived from the PSK ID that got sent. So it sent to the server all the information you need to figure out how to uh, encrypt and decrypt the data. And so using this knowledge, you can actually get rid of the whole uh, vendor server, act like you're the server, and take control of the device. And uh, this is the, the trick that was used to flash custom firmware then. And so when, uh, when, when we bought some of these lights for our home, we figured, OK, we can just use this Tuya Convert. And uh, our entire home will be cheaply filled with smart IoT devices that we can do fun stuff with. Wrong. At some point, uh, Tuya, the manufacturer of these devices, and millions of devices like them, they, um, 
Um, they manufacture them white label for uh, thousands of uh, manufacturers. They changed their firmware. They patched this stuff uh, that, uh, that Michael found, of course. Um, and from that point onwards, the pre-shared key was no longer derived from stuff that you could see publicly. Instead, it was seemingly, we think, uh, generated randomly at the factory, flashed to the device, unique per device, and you could no longer see it. Shit. So now what? We got a whole bunch of these lights, and we cannot do anything with them other than let them happily connect to their servers uh, of Tuya. So we figured, OK, if they're not vulnerable anymore, we simply have to make them vulnerable again, right? How hard could it be? And so um, there's a couple options, we thought. One, we can obtain the PSK again, either leaking it or changing it to some, some value that we want. Or we can try to downgrade this version 2 of the protocol back to version 1 that was vulnerable, and then use Tuya Convert again. Or if all else fails, we just get code execution on the light bulb, right? Well, you, you can guess where we ended up. So first off, we, we started with this uh, initial hardware uh, revision of them. This, this was uh, from light, light bulbs we bought in 2019, I think. It contained the ESP8266 chip, a very popular microcontroller that has Wi-Fi. Super popular, and because it's super popular, there's also a whole bunch of tooling that you could use. We could dump the firmware from these light bulbs using ESP tool, a common tool for uh, handling expressive chips. You get a raw uh, binary uh, flash dump from that that you can then load into a tool called ESP bin to elf that gives you an elf executable image, which you can load into Gidra using uh, an extension, um, a module for Extensa architecture. Then you, uh, you, uh, you analyze the, the firmware you dumped, and you find a whole bunch of functions that are not annotated. They don't have symbols, so you don't know what they do. There's a, a simple trick that you can use to uh, get at least symbols for many common functions, um, which is you just compile a demo application using the Espressive SDK. You analyze that in Gidra, and then you, com you compare the footprints of functions with each other. So you have a list of functions on the right, a list of functions on the left, and you can map them. There's tools to do this, but of course we didn't know about it back then, so we, uh, we uh, made a, a simple one of our own. We mapped these functions and uh, got, a, got a sort of lay of the land. We found out that Tuya, the manufacturer, runs free RTOS on these devices. Uh, in free RTOS, they, uh, they have a whole bunch of tasks. One task, the init task, that starts all the other tasks. And two, to us, particularly interesting ones, a task called uh, UDP receiver, which uh, listens for uh, broadcast uh, traffic on the network, and a task called smart frame task that handles commands that uh, you send to it via including this UDP receiver task. And on top of this, they, they have a, a bunch of drivers for controlling GPIO and, and, and PWM, PWM peripherals and this kind of stuff. All right, so now how do we, how do we get root on these things? Um, we found that there's a, a bunch of keys used in this firmware. The PSK key that we talked about previously that encrypts the connection to the server. You see that in uh, yellow on the slide. But also other ones, and, and this we, uh, we did, uh, did not know about before. So data inside of this TLS encrypted connection is encrypted and signed by something called the OS key, which after you activate the device via their servers over the internet, gets replaced by something called the SEC key. And all of that is separate from something called the local key, which you obtain after activation with the server. It's, it's initially empty, and uh, uh, after activation, you, uh, you, can, uh, you can get it, to then use the device on your local network without an internet connection. Well, we wanted to use it without connecting to the server in the first place, right? So our goal was to get ownership of these keys somehow without connecting to Tuya. 
And uh, for this part, I will uh, hand over to Gellet. Yes. So, we've um, analyzed and reverse engineered the firmware for uh, this particular revision for quite a while. We actually uh, stumbled on a few vulnerabilities throughout our analysis. However, as uh, luck would have it, we would not actually end up exploiting these particular vulnerabilities. So there's more later, of course, otherwise the talk would pretty much end here. But um, yeah, so we think these vulnerabilities are interesting. Nonetheless, we would like to uh, share, you, uh, share them uh, with you. And let's start with the uh, first one. So. Uh, what you see in front of you on the slide right now is a function in the uh, firmware. It generates a random string. Uh, you see it takes three parameters. The first one is completely unused. Uh, the second one is a character pointer. It's really a pointer to a buffer. And then uh, actually the maximum length, which is essentially the length of uh, the buffer itself. Uh, what the function does very briefly is it takes the uh, current time. And do keep in mind these uh, devices are uh, set up without a, a real-time clock uh, working. So essentially, this really is just a counter from uh, the boot time of the device. It just keeps incrementing uh, well, every second, sort of. Um, and it takes that. It um, generates some index uh, in it. And it indexes into this interesting uh, string that's highlighted in red. Uh, this is kind of an artifact from Ghidra, because that's where we copied the code from. But um, this is essentially this really massive uh, uh, long string that is hard-coded in the, in the firmware. And um, basically what this function does is it, uh, it takes a substring of that, returns it, and calls it random. Uh, now, that's obviously uh, not very random. Uh, but of course, you know, for a lot of things, um, yeah, you don't really need a cryptographically secure uh, random number generator or something of the sort. So would have been fine if you maybe per perhaps uh, come up with a, a construction like this for other purposes. However, if you use it for TLS, then you have other sort of problems. Um, what we ended up finding out is if you were to look at the uh, traffic uh, between the device and the uh, cloud server, uh, just zooming in here uh, on the client hello message from the client to the server, uh, you'll see that the random field that's highlighted in blue, um, and also in uh, the dump, you see it uh, bordered by red, is essentially pretty much the first part, like the first 30-something uh, characters of that uh, very, very long string. Now, in this particular setup, because they use TLS with uh, pre-shared keys, this isn't actually much of an issue. Uh, we actually uh, talked to uh, a friend who uh, did quite a bit of research on TLS. And um, we were wondering if this could be exploitable in the TLS PSK uh, setup. However, turns out uh, TLS 1.2 and up are actually uh, quite resilient protocols. And uh, this doesn't immediately lead to a vulnerability, as far as we know. Uh, however, uh, why we think this vulnerability is interesting is should they, uh, at any point, switch to uh, using Cypher suites that uh, actually uh, utilize a key exchange mechanism, such as uh, Diffie-Hellman uh, Merkle key exchanges, um, using perhaps certificates for uh, validating uh, the exchange process, then this would immediately yield a, a man-in-the-middle attack, because now that you have the uh, client random, um, which you can guess with uh, relatively high frequency uh, and figure out what the correct value is, if you just capture uh, the first few handshakes between uh, a client and a server, then you can just go ahead and derive the uh, TLS pre-master key uh, once, just keep reusing it over and over, and uh, that's pretty much a win. Um, we did some more analysis. Um, now, we uh, found some uh, protocols. As, as Tom mentioned, there were uh, some uh, function handlers that were handling messages from the network. Uh, some of them uh, were actually handling uh, messages from devices on the, on the local network. Um, in particular, these messages were uh, completely unencrypted, so we, uh, we thought that they would be uh, interesting candidates to look at the uh, functions that parse and handle them, because, well, yeah, those are ones that we can easily reach. We don't need any keys to uh, send messages to these handlers. And so we did, and we ended up finding two bugs there, a stack buffer overflow in the uh, function uh, that parses it, um, and a heap buffer overflow, and the same function, but for a different message. 
For the stack buffer overflow, um, the function is implemented as a free RTOS task. What that really kind of means in traditional uh, terms is it's a long-running process. It's essentially, uh, in this case, a, uh, an infinite uh, loop that just keeps on running, waiting for messages to come in. And um, for every message, it just parses it, does some handling, etc. Now, um, we had control over the, the stack somewhat. It was a uh, bug where we, uh, as long as we uh, are not writing null bytes, we can uh, modify the contents on the stack uh, uh, at the location of uh, the vulnerability. And that allowed us to overwrite the return address. Uh, should be a win, right? We should be able to just uh, go ahead and uh, take control of, uh, of co take control of the code flow, and then perhaps do something useful. However, um, well, yeah, it's an infinitely running process. It, uh, at no point does it ever return. Uh, we could not find a way to maybe trigger it into a fault mode that would have it to do an early return on, or some such. Uh, and sadly, uh, also analyzing the uh, stack um, parameters and around it, we couldn't really find anything interesting that we could use to make it do something a little bit more. So essentially, we could just crash it, and that was pretty much it. Uh, for the heap buffer overflow, uh, kind of a similar story. We could uh, manipulate the uh, metadata of the blocks that the heap allocator uh, takes, uh, keeps track of for allocations and freeze. Um, uh, we actually, we, so we, we decided to study it a little bit, and we found out that um, Tuya has just modified one of the heap implementations that's provided with free RTOS. Um, but Doing so far, we've done all of this statically, right? We're just uh, we have uh, Ghidra open, we've got our decompiler, disassemblers, and we're just kind of uh, analyzing code uh, manually, going through it by hand. Uh, but when it comes to things like allocator misuse uh, bugs, it's uh, at least in my experience a bit more tricky to do that just by hand. Uh, usually, it's quite nice to uh, see if you can get some dynamic analysis going, so some debugging, getting a bit of, a, of an understanding of what's actually happening in memory when you're doing all sorts of stuff. So we decided to take a little uh, detour then and um, uh, somehow rediscovered a, a nice uh, hardware hacking technique, which is if we just trigger the conditions that we want on the device, uh, reset it into uh, bootrom, and then use ESP tool, uh, the tool that was already there, we could actually get a really nice uh, RAM dump of uh, the contents of memory at the time we uh, triggered this process. And um, turns out you can just take this RAM dump and overlay it uh, onto your uh, binary in Ghidra. It supports that, which is quite nice. And then you can kind of see, so in this particular screenshot, you actually see one of the, the blocks of the uh, heap allocator that the, the, the heap allocator used. And you can kind of see the connections between them. So it's a bit more of a, a hybrid. Uh, you're not just uh, reverse engineering code. You also get some data in there. And you can kind of see how this um, uh, data relates to the instructions that uh, act upon it. Uh, we went a step further, actually. Um, so searching on the internet for uh, uh, if we can do um, on-chip debugging with the ESP8266 yielded a whole lot of no's. But there was one yes. There was one tutorial about using Visual GDB um, to debug applications on the ESP8266. However, uh, we would have preferred to utilize uh, just GDB and Open OCD. Those are the tools that we're more familiar with. So what we did is we uh, took a uh, we forked uh, the uh, Binutils GDB extensa. Uh, that's actually been tailored for the uh, ESP32. Modified it just a little bit to get it to, uh, to work nicely with the uh, ESP8266, and uh, got some help from some people on getting OpenOCD running uh, properly with our debuggers of choice uh, for the ESP8266. Now, um, this uh, helped us a lot. We actually uh, were able to uh, debug what's happening uh, on the chip as we're triggering the vulnerabilities and see uh, how things uh, progress and put breakpoints. Sadly, just one breakpoint. <laughs> so it was a bit of a monkey jumping around with that one breakpoint. It was not a very nice experience. Um, but it is what it is. Uh, we got somewhere where we didn't expect to. Uh, unfortunately, as we analyzed it more and more, uh, we realized that the conditions for that heap uh, buffer overflow um, in the ways that we found that we could possibly abuse it would actually need us to be able to write 
null bytes uh, in locations where, which are not at the end of that string, which we, we could have possibly been able to do. Uh, however, we really needed to do it somewhere in the middle just to get it to, to uh, trigger writes just the right way. Uh, so unfortunately, this particular bug was uh, not usable in this case. So uh, kind of wrapping up this uh, stage of our research, uh, we found a few bugs that, as I said, weren't easily exploitable. One of them actually didn't really apply at all, but we thought it was really cool, the TLS one. Uh, should they ever uh, move to uh, some sort of implementation with key exchange mechanisms, then that, uh, that uh, would immediately yield an attack. Uh, we kind of rediscovered a uh, nice technique, or at least we thought it was quite nice. We got debugging working. And more importantly, we learned a lot about Tuya stack. Um, this would actually kind of be the most critical point of our journey with the, e the ver first revision of the devices, as it would uh, actually help us a lot in the next stage. And um, speaking of the next stage, moving to Tom. So a few months passed. We uh, had no progress on the, on the ESP, um, but still we were curious, of course. And, uh, one of us, I forget who, went to the action, bought more of these lights, uh, different types, and we got, uh, we got a bit startled. Because all of a sudden, there was not an ESP8266 in there anymore, but a new chip, Chinese uh, manufacturer, Becken. We didn't know anything about it, a BK7231. And we thought, oh my god. Has all of our research been in vain? Did they just swap out a new chip? Everything is different. Um, so we went in search for a, a data sheet of this new mystery chip. We searched on Mauser and DigiKey, even Chinese LCSC. Uh, we could not find anyone supplying this chip and having a, a data sheet for it. Not on the Western internet anyway. Baidu to the rescue. So Baidu, a uh, Chinese search engine, uh, uh, is used uh, almost exclusively in China. Of course, when we searched there, uh, we, uh, we got a whole lot further. Um, some translations later, we, uh, we got the data sheet for this, uh, for this chip. Inside of the data sheet, it's mentioned that there's a, an ARM9 core inside uh, of a specific type. And that ARM9 core, that you can find on the Western internet very easily. From there, you can get the reference manual and see all kinds of things about uh, the debug peripherals it has, what kind of memory mapping is inside. And this gave us a whole lot of uh, information on how to analyze this new device. And what was even more interesting is what happened when you searched for this chip on the Western internet. Not for a data sheet, but just the chip name itself. We came to this uh, very interesting looking uh, GitHub repository. Do we now have an open source implement implementation from Tuya, the manufacturer of this device for the SDK? Yeah, it turned out we did. They completely open sourced all of their stuff. The SDK, uh, example applications that we found out are being used by manufacturers of these lights almost exclusively. It's all there. Of course, some of the internals are in, uh, in, in binary blob libraries. But because they're part of the SDK, you need to be able to link against them, which means that they need to have symbols, which means that now uh, we can load the library into Gidry, and we have a complete list of function names and this kind of stuff, structures, so that you can imagine you, this helps tremendously in reverse engineering. And so it did for us. One thing that's interesting is that uh, they, they named this new real-time operating system IoT OS. And so we were curious to see if we would have to learn uh, a different OS in our future endeavors. But luckily, it ends up we do not. It's just free RT OS with some sauce of them, uh, of Tuya, on top of it. So not only did we not lose progress, we actually gained a lot. The stack is still the same. But now we have the source. We have all the symbol names. Uh, we have a lot nicer time debugging, because this ARM core chip uh, supports a lot easier uh, debugging than the, the Espressive chip does. It just has a JTAG interface you can connect to. 
And so now we, uh, we dove in again. And for this part, I'll hand over to Gellert again. Right. So, as uh, Tom mentioned, the SDK and the blobs in it actually helped us quite a lot. We thought, hey, we could uh, get a really nice uh, uh, quick start on, on analyzing this particular new revision by just, well, looking at the SDK itself. Uh, so I started uh, reverse engineering, uh, sort of. It is mostly simplicated, easy to go through. Uh, the uh, binary blobs that we found in the SDK and um, because we've already seen quite a lot of what uh, Tuya does, we've been familiarized with the protocols, I had a pretty good idea of, OK, what are the usual suspect protocols that have some interface to the outside world that we can perhaps control? So I started looking through these, and um, I stumbled upon this particular uh, piece of code. It's kind of uh, condensed from the original, of course, just for, uh, for, for visuals. Um, but essentially, what this is is a uh, task definition for a free R2S task that the device runs when you set it in a particular configuration mode. You do so by uh, power cycling the device a specific number of times. Uh, this uh, sets it in uh, what's called uh, AP mode, where the device essentially broadcasts an, uh, an access point and you connect to it with your, uh, with your mobile phone, and you have uh, Tuya's app or any of their other rebranded apps uh, on your phone, which has a nice UI. It tells you exactly what to do to get that device onboarded onto your home uh, access point with your home network. Um, what this function uh, does then is it uh, actually listens on uh, that uh, access, uh, AP network. It listens for uh, UDP messages um, that the application sends. And what these messages look like, uh, as an example shown on the right, essentially it's pretty simple. It's uh, some uh, simple format. Uh, it's a type length value around a JSON blob. Uh, completely unencrypted, the app just sends that when it gets uh, the parameters from you, the user. Um, the first uh, two parameters are the SID and the passphrase. That's your uh, home network configuration parameters that uh, it will use to connect. Uh, the last one is a token that it actually gets from the uh, from Tuya servers, and it's essentially just used to get the device uh, to uh, initially authenticate with the server. So, um, looking on the left side, how it's being parsed, it's just uh, using CJSON, a, uh, an, a small library for uh, parsing uh, JSON uh, in C. Uh, it's used quite uh, quite heavily in embedded uh, embedded projects, as we've seen. Um, so just uses CJSON, uh, takes that uh, JSON payload, parses it, and then it uh, gets the data and then copies it into some uh, structure. So there's some uh, global structure, so this LAN access point network config, and um, it copies the parameters in it. We noticed one particular interesting copy over here. It's highlighted in, uh, in red. I hope you can see it. Um, for specifically the token field uh, from the token on the right, the AP configuration token, um, the copy process is slightly different than the other two fields. Why? Not sure. Um, but um, what we saw is that the token length is first calculated as a C string, so it calls a strlen on it, gets uh, the length of that, and then uses uh, memcopy uh, to copy uh, that much uh, data that it just calculated with strlen into that field. OK, could be OK, but there are no, no checks on it. Um, but it depends on how big uh, that field is. And uh, do keep in mind that the JSON messages are not allowed to be more than 256 bytes. So it could still be all right. However, looking up, this is actually the structure that it copies into. That token field is only 64 bytes long. We can go up to 256 bytes. OK. Well. What that really means is we can uh, set a token field that is much, much larger, or at least just larger than 64 bytes, and then we'll start overwriting fields in that global configuration structure uh, that may actually yield something interesting. And lo and behold, there's something interesting, almost way too convenient, really. There's this um, finish CB. That's uh, one of the fields in uh, that structure. It's a function pointer. And it happens to be called immediately after our out-of-bounds write, our memcopy. 
So that's fantastic. So all we have to do is just have a uh, token that is uh, 72 bytes or, uh, well, seven, longer than 72 bytes, and it will start overwriting that uh, callback function pointer. So now we have uh, control, sorry. Now we have control over the uh, program counter, which essentially um, allows us to uh, jump wherever we want in the firmware. But all, the, all of this we've done so far on the, um, on the SDK blobs. We don't really know if the devices themselves are vulnerable. Uh, we've tested them a little bit, kind of black box, by trying to exploit them, but it's, it's, it's a little unclear. So we decided the next step is to get firmware dumps. The plan here was to uh, dump the firmware, uh, analyze it, reverse engineer it in Gitter like we've done so far, kind of uh, compare and figure out, OK, does this actually exist in the same way? Um, additionally, we also get to figure out which locations in the code are interesting. However, we really did not know much about this chip. So as Tom uh, mentioned, um, you know, documentation is, is, is scarce if non-existent. So how are we actually going to uh, dump the firmware? So turns out there is a, a serial protocol that this device implements um, in its bootloader that uh, allows us to uh, read uh, flash, read some of the device uh, metadata as well. And do keep in mind that uh, Flash is embedded on this device. It's not actually external, which is why this was a little tricky. Uh, the only problem is we don't really know much about this uh, serial protocol besides that, uh, well, yeah, it exists. Well, turns out we knew a little bit more. So uh, Tuya had uh, some uh, developer uh, documentation that actually explained for um, uh, OEMs that would use their, their services, how do you uh, flash your firmware onto the device, uh, both using their own tools as well as using this very interesting uh, binary called the BK7231 chip flashing tool. So we started looking around uh, for, for information about this based on this uh, newfound knowledge. And luckily, uh, we, were, we, we actually ended up finding an open source project from one of uh, Beckin employees. And Beckin is the company that uh, makes these chips. And it's this tool that actually uh, implements this uh, bootloader serial protocol. Uh, however, not very luckily, the tool was uh, quite unreliable for us. We really could not get it to work to read Flash uh, at all. Uh, for whatever reason, it would just uh, hiccup or, or something would go wrong, and we weren't exactly sure uh, what's wrong with it. Um, we tried to modify it, but that kind of didn't, uh, didn't work out all too well. So we decided to use the information that we have from this tool and the fact that we have a copy of the bootloader in the SDK to uh, both reverse engineer the, the, the bootloader so we can actually see what that serial protocol does from uh, the horse's mouth, so to speak, as well as use uh, the um, uh, library that we found, the tool that we found, as kind of a, a quick guide point, because we can then just figure out, OK, what sort of artifacts do we really need to search for in the bootloader so we don't have to uh, really go through the code uh, in depth uh, to figure out wh where we need to look for this part. Um, so we spent some time on it. And uh, after a while, uh, we've figured out how it works. We decided to write our own tool. It's called the BK7231 uh, Tools. And uh, essentially, it allowed us to uh, now dump the firmware. But next step, we just have a flash dump. We actually need to analyze it before we can look at any code. So luckily for us, um, the, the SDK is, is uh, open source. And this, this part, of the, the part of the linking of the blobs together after compilation is, is, is available, so we could just go through it. Uh, what we learned is that there are two code partitions on, on Flash. Uh, the first partition is just the, the bootloader itself, the second stage bootloader after the boot ROM. And the second part is, well, what's interesting, the user application, or uh, so they called it. Uh, the user application is essentially what we're interested in. Uh, there are other partitions as well, and they're uh, defined by this user application. Uh, but of course, in a very uh, you know, embedded software fashion, um, the code sections are uh, encrypted. And uh, by encryption, we really mean obfuscation, because the 
encry the encryption key is just hard coded in the SDK. Uh, so we had to deal with that a little bit as well. Uh, now, of course, we just implemented all of that in BK7231 tools, so it just does the whole process now from dumping the, uh, the flash from the device with that serial protocol to uh, decrypting uh, the code blocks and actually unwrapping their custom uh, uh, sort of uh, uh, format that they use both for um, on-chip uh, over, over the air updates. It's called an RBL format. So we were, did a little bit more reverse engineering around their, uh, their binary tools that they had in the, in the SDK. So now, armed with uh, all of this information, it's now time to uh, start making our bug a little bit more uh, useful. So let's do a quick recall. This is actually what we had. We had the configuration message coming in. We had the token field. And if it's longer than 72 bytes, we would overwrite this uh, function pointer. So here's an idea. Uh, we, do have, uh, we don't actually have control at all on the stack at the time of invocation here. However, um, there are some registers that, are, uh, that, that, that point to data that we control, namely the data that's uh, parsed in this uh, JSON object. So hey, maybe we can write shell code and just jump to it on the stack, you know, this, this usually works. Uh, well, turns out that was not quite the case. Uh, this was quite surprising for us because the Arm V9 is a very old, old, old chip. Um, and as far as we can tell, it doesn't have any memory protection units or uh, any sort of memory management units. So there should be, uh, like almost all memory regions should be executable. But uh, for whatever reason, this really uh, did not work at all. So even though we have control flow redirection, well, we didn't really have much yet. But there are techniques to deal with that. Um, so we could do uh, return-oriented programming or call-oriented programming or some version of, uh, of them and basically reuse the code that is already in the, um, in the firmware to, to kind of do our bidding. Now, um, we did actually end up um, uh, figuring out something around that. Um, we thought that, uh, and from, from previous runs with the ESP uh, version, we knew that there is a way to overwrite uh, the pre-shared key uh, through a call to the API. Um, and then the device would uh, pull that uh, new key from uh, the server and uh, overwrite it in Flash. So we found that function, and we thought, OK, this is uh, a really nice uh, function that we could uh, jump into. So this is a piece of code that's already on the device. And uh, all we have to do is just massage the parameters a little bit. And if we just return to that function, it'll overwrite the appreciate key for us. And we'll end up with a win condition. However, it turns out that this was really not sufficient. Um, overwriting the PSK worked. We did actually get it to kind of downgrade into uh, the previous uh, protocol that it had, the Tuya convert uh, abused. However, um, the SDK is written such that it does not actually uh, accept unencrypted traffic within the TLS connection, which the previous version did. So we kind of had to reassess what can we do here? What's, what's our pathing to, to, to get this? Um, so we actually did manage to overwrite the PSK. The downgrade doesn't work. Code execution, a mm, little bit uh, tricky still. But we can maybe find a way to overwrite the security keys, which turns out is exactly what we did. So we thought, OK, they have some function that they use to write this pre-shared key parameter uh, and persist it to flash. Perhaps we could just you know, search for other functions that maybe use this function. So we started on this uh, little uh, journey for uh, what's called gadget hunting. And a gadget really is just a, a piece of code that does something useful that we want to, uh, that we want to achieve. And uh, in this particular case, we were looking for uh, two, per two gadgets. We were looking for something that sets the security keys that we can just jump right into and let it do our bidding. And perhaps one or more uh, quote unquote fix up gadgets. And these uh, just do simple tasks of moving registers about just to get things in the right uh, order. Uh, we used a tool called uh, Ropper to, uh, to analyze uh, the firmware. It's, uh, it's uh, for, for, for uh, the second type of gadgets. Uh, it's a tool commonly used in, in exploitation, also for traditional systems. So 
Um, as we moved about, we actually ended up finding out uh, one such nice uh, target gadget, so that function that overwrites all the keys. Uh, we noticed that uh, this WD uh, GW base IF write was used to overwrite the PSK, and just by kind of cross-referencing back what sort of other functions refer, uh, refer to that function, we ended up finding this handy-dandy function that does not seem to be called at all by any tasks but seems to exist for the purposes of writing these configuration uh, parameters to the device in the factory through some serial protocol. Uh, it's pretty straightforward. All it does is it takes a JSON uh, payload over serial, parses it, and then just uses it to overwrite the, the, the parameters in Flash. Uh, so this looked like a, a great and fantastic candidate for us to use. And since we already had a JSON uh, blob that we actually sent to uh, the um, to the uh, to the task to actually exploit it. Um, essentially, this was just a matter of swapping some registers around because we already had a nice pre-parsed JSON object. Uh, and in order to do this swapping around, we have the fix-up gadgets, also trampoline gadgets on the side. As you can see, this one uh, it simply sets uh, the first register R0 to the value of the register R7. Uh, I think in this particular case, it was uh, the uh, JSON object indeed. And then it uh, pulls uh, R3 on the third line from some other uh, data section that we actually had some control over. So in this way, we could do some jump that does some uh, register swap. And then from the register swap, we can go to a secondary location, um, which essentially should be our target gadget. And kind of putting everything uh, together over here, uh, we had the setup where we had the vulnerable function called the fix-up gadget, does some register swaps. And then we end up in our uh, lovely uh, function that did all the work for us. Now, that's not quite over yet, so we're just moving to Tom here to explain what we did after that. Yeah, so now um, we, uh, we have an exploit. We uh, can, uh, can set the keys, uh, but it's not, uh, not usable for uh, people aside from the two of us yet, right? So we built a, a small tool called Tuya Cloud Cutter. It contains all of, all of this uh, exploit uh, toolchain steps, uh, plus uh, some additional things. So you can use it to override all of the keys, PSK, ASCII, uh, local key, SEC key. By doing that, it, it uh, disallows the device from connecting to Tuya, so it's cut off from the cloud. Uh, it allows you to connect locally with this local key. Uh, and so you can use it in complete isolation on your own network. And then also, uh, you can use Tuya Cloud Cutter to uh, write your own firmware if you like. If you're interested in it, check it out on GitHub. There's a, there's a link in the slides also. But I think now uh, we should use uh, the last final uh, minutes that we have uh, for actually trying to show you. I'm going to put this uh, light bulb from action into AP mode by flicking the switch six times. Gellet is going to connect uh, to it uh, via his laptop. And then he's going to run the first step of the, the exploit toolchain. So it's blinking slowly now, which means it's in AP mode. All right, now we have the exploit. All right, so the exploit has run. I don't, I don't know if you can see it. It's all the way at the bottom of the, of the beamer here. We put it in AP mode once again this time to configure it to join a different access point that Gellet has on his, uh, on his mobile phone, his hotspot. And then from there, we can connect to it using the local key to make it do something. And hopefully, we can show you that it will do something. Of course, these kinds of demos are uh, super, uh, super dangerous to do on a camp like this. Huh? So this is all connecting over Wi-Fi to each other on a stage with, uh, I don't know, uh, 50 people here and hundreds around. So we've got configuration messages now from the device. We've, uh, they, we know the exploit worked because we can actually see them. They're plain text, so we're doing them in the middle correctly. And now the device should be on our access point. So let's uh, 
scan for it. So we just need to figure out uh, if it was onboarded correctly. Hopefully it is. And oh, I am on the incorrect network. Tends to happen on live demos. So right now, the bulb should be connected to Gellet's mobile phone. It's running a hotspot. He's connecting his laptop to the same hotspot. And then the laptop can send commands directly to the light bulb. If things work out, we'll see, yeah? Yeah. There we go. Found the device. Just need to get its IP address. And we have a little uh, script that would then use the uh, local key that we've set on the device to actually make it do something a little bit more interesting, such as this. <laughs> oh. So we'll leave this running in the, in the background. There we go. Right, now back to Tom. All right, so uh, in, uh, in closing, uh, we found a, a really cool bug that seems to be present in all devices containing this new chip, which uh, we think is any device made by Tuya, millions of them since uh, around uh, 2020. Um, we did a vulnerability disclosure to Tuya. They were really cool about it, really nice people, responded super quickly, and they gave us a bug bounty for it. We donated it to charity, to a foundation that teaches kids how to hack, which we thought was, uh, was really cool. Uh, and for us, this, uh, this was a uh, first experience, or for me, it was the first experience of doing a vulnerability disclosure. Gellet did it before. Um, so that, that was really nice, and uh, one, one uh, takeaway for us as well was Embedded security is catching up. This kind of stuff we had with not being able to just uh, send shell code to the device and jump into it because of non-executable memory. It shows that uh, steps are being taken. Um, however, it's still far behind personal computing. Huh? So this makes it a really interesting target for us. And so uh, our message is that it's still juicy to uh, look into these embedded devices because many of the tricks that have not worked in personal computing uh, for uh, quite a while now, they still work here. All right, and with that, uh, we will leave you. We want to thank uh, a couple of people, Jus, uh, Blasti, Yilles, and, uh, and Vtrust for helping us along the way. If you would like to get in touch with us, uh, our stuff is up there. And thanks a lot for listening. Thank you so much. That was amazing. I'm not really a tech person, and I understood so much of it. Um, we have two um, vacancies open at my school for computer science teachers, so if you're interested. Um, now, if there are any questions to them, there are mics in the middle. Please use them to ask uh, a question, if you have one. No questions? Well, I think if you come up with a question, they're still approachable after the talk or somewhere around camp. And uh, thank you so much. Another big applause, please.